Well, it's good to be with you again as we continue in our series called Generations, as we are casting a vision for the future of our church. This vision is not just one that has come to us now uh, in 2018, but it's a vision that has been present in our church across the generations, going back to the founding of this church. Over the last few months, our vision team has been working to distill this vision to speak about it with fresh new language. We've been getting to the core of who we are as a church. And now, as we are going public with this vision, we are articulating what it means for us to be the first Presbyterian church in Wheaton now, on this corner of the neighborhood. What does this mean for us? So we started last week as we announced our new mission, inviting all generations into a growing life with Jesus Christ. We talked about how you can carry this mission forward, and it's a mission that I hope we'll all learn by heart so that we can embody it and embed it into the fabric of our church. That it wouldn't just be words on a wall, but it would be the what behind everything we do. One of the hardest things for our vision team was categorizing and naming what we'll call our values. Every church, every organization has either spoken or unspoken values. And so we have sought to name the most important things that we value as a church. If the mission is the what, then the values are the why. They are the why behind everything we do, why we do what we do. They are our motives, our motivations behind every ministry we have, the way that we structure our programs and our offerings, they are embedded and guide everything that we do. So, after the work we've been spending time in, I'd like to share those with you today. We have four of them, and I'll, I'll share them with you on the screen. Our four values for going forward as a church that define everything we do, would you read them with me? Abundant compassion, intentional growth, joyful generosity, and devoted community. As you see this list, I hope that some of these ideas, some of these words, and some of these values resonate with you with what it means to be a part of our church. And if you're new to our church, if you've been coming just recently, if you've been here in the last year or two, I hope that even in your brief experience at this church, that you have found some of these values to be evident. But here is our challenge right now as a church as we go forward. We could have listed any number of values. There was a very long list of possibilities for us. But we have to make sure that these are present and and in the forefront of our mind as we are doing life and ministry together. Today, we are going to focus in on one, and that's the value of intentional growth. We have defined growth for our church as being intentional, not simply just growth that we pursue randomly or or that is simply an outcome of anything we do, but the growth that we see and experience is intentional. Intentional simply means to focus on something. We all know that. And as I was thinking about growth and this concept of what it means to be growing, I was struck by the fact that when we, when we, when we define what growth is, it really means one step in the process of growing. Growth is a process. It's not a destination. We never reach the point of being fully grown in our faith, in our church, 
and in all the ways that you live and carry out your lives, we never stop growing. So we are intentional about this value we're calling growth, and we want to foster it, to encourage it, to see it unfold in the life of our church. The Apostle Paul spoke to this concept and used language that helped to define one of the most widely read and known books in all of Scripture, the book of Romans, the letter to the church at Rome. And it's in the 12th chapter, one of the most popular chapters in Paul's book, that he speaks to this same concept that we're talking about today. And so we're going to spend some time there reading in Romans chapter 12. We're going to read the first eight verses of this scripture together. I invite you to read in your Bible and one we provided for you, or you can follow along with the scripture on the screen. Paul writes this. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ. And individually, we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. This is the word of the Lord. In about the year 1560, the leaders of the Reformation were involved in putting together what became known as the Geneva Bible. Geneva was one of the key cities in the process of the Reformation. And through the work of these theologians, these translators, these leaders of this movement, they put together what would become a prominent translation of the Bible at that time. Over the course of the next several decades, they would also include some commentaries on the scripture and the verses themselves to include the most significant leaders of the Reformation, the likes of John Calvin, Luther, Zwingli, among many others. This is a version of the Bible and its commentary that predated the King James Version, which became the dominant translation later on. These leaders of the Reformation, much like the early church in the first century, were leading a rebirth of the church. They were leading this church in a new direction. They were casting a new vision. And their source, their foundation, was the scriptures themselves. Several of these theologians and Reformation leaders commented in a very special way and in a very profound way on these specific verses in Romans. They would go on to say several things, one of which, as Paul notes is that as we offer ourselves as living sacrifices, it's a reminder of two things, two very important things. One is that the altar of God is no longer limited to the holy place, the holy gathering of place. In fact, the altar of God is out in the world. 
Paul himself was casting a vision, a missional vision for taking this gospel out into the world, not just in the safe confines of the church or where the people of God are comfortably gathered, but sharing it, extending it beyond simply the locale of where the church address might be. The second important thing, as they were reflecting on Paul's words, is that in ancient times, the people of God made sacrifices of dead things. But Paul offers a new language, if you caught it, that these aren't dead offerings, they're living offerings. And that we're, not, we're no longer using substitutes to offer to God, but we ourselves are the offerings. Jesus has come once and for all in our place to make the ultimate sacrifice, and that has empowered us, freed us up to daily make of ourselves living offerings, consecrated to God. Spiritual worship, as Paul says, spiritual growth. What is spiritual growth? How would we define that? How would Paul define that? Well, we could pay attention to one of the first couple verses in that passage. In one phrase in particular, that we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. A renewed mind. That is the essence of spiritual growth. Not that we ever reach a state of spiritual perfection... Only God is perfect, only Jesus is perfect. But we live and evolve and grow into a mature body of believers. To be spiritual growing is to be experiencing a renewal of our mind. And in that process, we are transformed. We're no longer the same. And this is for the whole body of believers, the many members that are a part of it. As Paul says, there are many members and we have different gifts and abilities to share. A crucial takeaway for this passage and maybe even a, a direction for you to go is to know this, that your gifts enable growth. Your gifts empower growth. Growth. How has God gifted you? Is it, in, as Paul says, in teaching? Is it in encouragement? Do you have a vision for a ministry that you have been a part of maybe at this church? Maybe you have a, a vision for meeting a need in the community that is not yet met. Maybe you very well have a gift by which growing and extending and stretching yourself, enlarging your own vision, will make even more possible the greater mission of God. I'd like to apply this concept of intentional growth, this value of our church, inspired by Paul's words, by some of the thoughts of the reformers in the church during that season of rebirth. I'd like to apply those same things to where we are as a church, not just to where we are right now, but also to where we have been. I like to apply intentional growth and to dissect that a little further in three specific ways. One is by looking at relationships. Another is by looking at ministry. And the third is by looking at the church, growth in all of those different things. The first pastor of this church was named Dr. Robert Shepherd. He had a heart for people, a heart for ministry, and in particular, he formed very positive relationships with the youth of the church at that time. One of the things, as he grew in relationships with these young people, is he noticed that in the original church in downtown Wheaton, there wasn't appropriate recreational space for the youth at that time. And so he sought to grow 
those relationships by fostering a space that would be able to facilitate the nurturing of these relationships, being able to spend time together in a fun and a meaningful way. So he enlisted the youth of the church who represented free labor, and they started to dig out the basement of the church. They were transforming it into a wreck area. And it became a very popular one. In fact, it was open every night of the week. Youth of the church and even members of the community would gather for fellowship, for recreation together. It, was, it became the very foundation of what this church would be. Forming and fostering these meaningful relationships. In a very controversial move, Dr. Shepard even had a pool table placed in the church. Now, at this time, that was just something you didn't do. Other churches and other Christians in the area couldn't believe what was taking place, that a pool table would be in a sacred place of worship and gathering. But Dr. Shepard had a vision. He had a bigger picture of growing these relationships and using the things that he knew these youth would relate with and placing them as a first priority. We've seen this play out over the decades as our youth ministry has continued to be a priority in the church. We have many thriving ministries for our students and youth. We have a great legacy of ministry to young people that began a long, long time ago, 109 years ago. That seems like a long time. But guess what? God is still up to something now. Forming these relationships, helping to grow these relationships, not only with the youth of the church and in their ministries together, but also with all of us. Might we learn from that example from that model of ministry, growing relationships together. The other connection we have, as I see, to intentional growth as we look over the history of the church is the fact that last year we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the First Pres Preschool that started in 19. 67. This was a ministry that met the needs of not only the members of this church as this preschool grew, but as it is today, many members of this community. It started with someone using their gift, using their passion, creating a space and a time to foster the youngest members, the youngest generation of this church and in this community. And I stand before you today not only as the pastor of this church, but also as a parent of a preschooler. Our daughter Hadley has been in the preschool now. This is her second year. She was incredibly excited to move from two days last year to three days this year. She was devastated when school end ended last spring. And she was so excited when she knew that school was starting up again this fall. One of the highlights for me last year was getting to be the guest reader for the class, getting to be the parent who came and read the story for her two-year-old two class, the terrific twos. We read a classic, I'm sure you all remember, The Wheels on the Bus. Uh, but this was the Pete the Cat version, okay? This is no average wheels on the bus. Pete the cat is a pretty cool cat, a pretty cool dude, and all the kids were there. I, I was more nervous than standing up here preaching the sermon. I'll tell you. What I experienced in that moment was how significant growing the minds and the lives of these children are. If intentional growth is one of our values, and if we could focus on only that ministry, we would have been doing well in the sight of God. It's not only limited to our children, 
But our preschool ministry reflects this value of intentional growth in the most formidable years of development. Would we continue to encourage and foster those who are leading the preschool to be praying for it and to be encouraging all the kids in our community as they grow in their lives and as they grow in their faith in Christ? The beginning of the year, just a couple weeks ago, I was able to sit down with the preschool teachers to have a devotional time with them. And what we talked about was this same concept of a body with many members, each having different gifts to share. All of them are representing this value of intentional growth as they support our kids and the kids in this community. The last way I want to explore intentional growth for us today is by talking about how it's been played out in the community around us, taking the church beyond this location. In the 60s and 70s, the 1960s and 70s, that is, our church and the pastor's knew that they needed to and felt strongly in supporting new church development. As the community was growing, as the church was growing, it wasn't simply going to be about building up this church and growing this church in particular, but it was going to be about starting new churches, new gathering places for the body of believers. And so during those decades... This church, First Presbyterian Church, helped to plant two other churches that are still in operation today in this community, Hope Presbyterian and Heritage Presbyterian. Even decades ago, the leadership and the membership of this church was intentional about growth. They were prioritizing intentional growth, maybe without even calling it that. The growth of the church. The growth of the church in this community. And it wasn't all about us. As Paul talks about, he says, have sober judgment. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Don't we all need to be reminded of that from time to time? As our church took a leading role in planning these other churches the gospel could bear fruit in the communities around us. Intentional growth wasn't just a value on a list, on a wall, on a church office. It was an embodied value. And so it is for us today. What does it mean to continue to take God's mission into our community? We're really understanding intentional growth in two ways. If you think about, well, what does it really mean for us to name this value? It means two things. That we are focusing on growing our relationship with Christ and growing in our understanding of God's kingdom here in this community. Paul picks up this theme of growth, but he, he addresses it not in Romans, but in 1 Corinthians, to a church that was on the brink of disaster. There was a, a great disagreement going on in the life of the church, and it had a lot to do with who was getting credit for growth that was taking place, or lack thereof. Paul had one of his companions, one of his uh, fellow ministry leaders, who was named Apollos. Apollos was helping to lead and to start churches as well, and together they were on this missionary journey of spreading the good news of Christ. So Paul addresses in a letter to the Corinthian church this very issue. And he, he brings up, he uses this, this image of, of watering 
a seed that would, would grow and, and bear fruit. Paul talks about himself as planting the seed of faith. Apollos watering it, nurturing it, encouraging it. But who provides the growth? Who ultimately is the one responsible and gets the credit for any growth that happens personally, organizationally? Well, that's God. And Paul made that point primary that God provides the growth. That's ultimately what intentional growth is about. It's recognizing our job and God's job. We can't cause ourselves to grow spiritually, but we can schedule ourselves to be daily in God's word, to be in the rhythm and the habit of walking with Jesus, paying attention to that daily devotional every day. And a product of that will be spiritual growth. We can ourselves cause this church and its ministries to strengthen and to grow, but we can share our gifts and to put our best selves forward, to offer ourselves to enhance God's mission in this community. We can't cause growth, but we ourselves, we are the vehicles by which God causes growth. Sometimes alongside us, maybe sometimes even in spite of us. Would you know today and would you be encouraged to seek and pursue intentional growth in your own spiritual life? And would you come alongside us as we have launched this new vision and, mi vision and mission to be intentional about growing together? Intentional, me intentional growth for us means to grow in relationships. It means to grow in our ministries, and it means to grow in our mission. Would we unite together in this? And would we do all things by God's grace. If you're with me today, let's say amen. Amen. amen.